Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. I'm Kevin Pashalik. Uh, I am one of the missionaries of our church here. I'll say that because we're on a Zoom meeting, not something that's streaming. And uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm also a member here, my wife and I. Uh, you see my wife up here on the worship team uh, occasionally. And uh, we love this church. We are really grateful for a good gospel preaching, Bible teaching church with, uh, that really has friendly people in it. So um, we're really glad to be here. Tonight, I'd like to ask you a question. We are, uh, I don't know if you ever had this experience. Tell me if you've had a similar experience. You invite somebody to church because I think you are the kind of people, if you come on Wednesday night, you're the kind of people who invite folks to church. If you ever invited somebody to church and their first question is, is it a spirit-filled church? Have you ever, ever had that, ex that experience? No, no, yes, you have. Okay. Ah, okay. So that you think that's what your friend, the person who asked you that question is asking. That's a great question, isn't it? Do we take God seriously? And we want to honor and respect that kind of perspective. I'll tell you, theologically at least, this is what we are, where, what they are asking. What they're asking actually is, does your teach this experience of receiving another work of the Holy Spirit after you've been saved? They have a different idea of what it means to be spirit filled when that happens. Uh, than the word of God actually teaches. Worse yet, have you ever had somebody ask you, are you filled, have you been filled with the spirit? You have, you have, okay, I've had that too. And my answer sometimes to these, these dear, good folks is uh, yes, but not in the sense you mean, in a biblical sense instead. So now what's our attitude toward charismatic and Pentecostal people? We love them. Okay, I want to be very clear about that. We love these people, but we do not have to accept their doctrine just because we love them. Matter of fact, because we love them, we should seek to understand what the Word of God says, the truth about these experiences, so that we can share the truth with them as well. Of course, it's a long slog. It's a, long, it's a lot of work to clarify these issues for, uh, for our charismatic or Pentecostal friends. We, what we want to do tonight, what I'd like to do tonight is to... Uh, to take a look at the way they look at, at the day of Pentecost and then explain why that's wrong and where that, because this is where their idea that we receive the Holy Spirit after we are saved, where that idea comes from. So our charismatic friends look at Pentecost and they say, oh, look, the apostles were already saved. And then later they received the Holy Spirit. This must be a pattern for all the Christians living today. Well, if you start with the day of Pentecost, or if you start in the Gospels, uh, you know, you can be forgiven for understanding, having that kind of understanding, even though it's pretty clear, even from, from that data set, that that's not really what's happening. But if the mistaken frame of reference, that is a mistaken frame of reference for those questions. What we want to do tonight is look at um, the Word of God, starting in the Old Testament, and look at the characteristics of his work then, his work in the Gospels, and then his work beginning on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to, what we're going to see is going to explode this idea that, uh, that we receive the Holy Spirit after we're saved, and so that there's this second work of the Spirit afterwards. Um, if you're tired of being made to feel like a second-class class Christian because you don't have somebody else's experience, tonight is your night. Okay, we're going to deal with that, uh, with that issue in, in a kind way. I'm going to be very factual. But I hope that I will also be kind because that's my intention. We don't hate charismatic people. We don't hate Pentecostal people. We love them. But I do not like charismatic doctrine because it leads to a lot of other weirdness. I'll just be nice. All right. So we can't deal with all the errors in those questions that I just asked. Are you, have you been filled with the Spirit? Is yours a Spirit-filled church? But what, we're, what I want to do is forever free you of the need to wonder if there is some experience that you're missing. Our charismatic friends aren't aware or they don't understand the changes in the work of the Holy Spirit over the course of biblical history. So they misunderstand his work on the day of Pentecost. They think you are missing something. I want us to look tonight at what they are missing. What they're missing is the perspective of what the Holy Spirit has been doing throughout creation, throughout the time of ever since creation. What we're going to see, where this falls, at the, we're going to group this information under three headings. And you, there's a handout that has this slide on it back there at the back. If you haven't gotten it, I encourage you to pick it up. It'll help you keep from uh, get your ball lost in the weeds as I kind of go pretty quickly here. If you have questions, 
stop me. If you can't understand what I'm saying, stop me, okay? I would take it as a favor if you did that. I sometimes do not speak as clearly as I wish. So if you're not getting what I'm saying, give me one of these or raise your hand, okay? I would really appreciate that help. All right, so let's just quickly look at these three columns as an overview of the Holy Spirit's work uh, as we see it in the, in the scriptures. In the Old Testament times, we could characterize the Old Testament's work as partial. That seems like an almost wrong thing to say, but it's a reality compared to his New Testament work. He worked in only part of his ministries. He didn't do everything in the Old Testament that he does in the New Testament from the day of Pentecost on. Uh, he worked part-time. He came and went. He, he didn't dwell on anybody full-time all the time. And also part of the believers. He only worked in, in part of believers that we could document from the word of God. Now things began to change. That was characteristic of the entire Old Testament, uh, the old time covered by the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through Malachi. In the gospels, things began to change. It was a transitional period for the work of the spirit. This is just the overview. We're gonna go into a little more detail in a minute. The guy in the gospels, his work was still partial, but expanding. That now there was a very unique work of the Holy Spirit in and through the Son of God, through Jesus. God, the Holy Spirit, worked in him and through him. God, the Holy Spirit, was responsible for overshadowing Mary so that Jesus was conceived in her womb uh, without sin. Uh, and he, he empowered Jesus. He said that Jesus claimed that the Holy Spirit was on him and had anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor and do all kinds of miracles. Uh, and so there was that unique work, but we're not going to talk about that tonight because it's not relevant to our particular question, though it is really well worth looking into and studying. I want us to see that in the Gospels, his work was still partial, as you see, as you will see when we get to those, to those references. It was still temporary. He, he would come and go. Uh, and that there was something that was new that was added. People could ask. Believers could ask. And God would give them the Holy Spirit. We'll come to all that in just a minute. Now, from the day of Pentecost, his ministries are full in contrast with the partial ministries of the Old Testament. There's the full ministries of the New Testament. And beginning on the day, I shouldn't say it New Testament because the Gospels are in New Testament, right? And that's what is part of what causes the confusion. The New Testament work of the Spirit, the church age, doesn't begin until the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And so from that point on, from the day of Pentecost, from Acts to the church age, the Holy Spirit works, began to work in all of his different ministries. And we'll talk about what those are when we come to that in a moment. And he worked in for all the time. He came and he didn't leave. And he works in all of the believers, which is the unique privilege of this uh, post-Pentecost church age. So that went by pretty quick, right? So now let's let's slow down. And actually, I have to keep moving because I got a lot of slides to go through here. But we're going to look at those same three columns. But so you can make your notes there on the on the on the page. And the big ideas are there on your handout. We're going to explore this in a little more detail. now. So in the Old Testament, again, what what was characteristic of the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament? It was partial. It was partial. And one part of that is that he only worked in part of his ministries now some of his by ministries i mean the things that he does okay some of those ministries spread across both testaments like revelation revealing truth to his to his prophets inspiration guiding the prophets so that they what they wrote down was exact representation of what god had revealed and then illumination teaching people what the uh, what the word of God had to say. David says, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. That's what we call theologically illumination. And he, did, he did that from the very beginning, teaching believers uh, what his word says. He also restrained sin. Genesis 6 talks about him restraining sin. He did miracles, of course. And then he filled people or empowered people uh, to accomplish God's purpose for their, in their lives. Uh, he brought about conviction of sin, and he taught people. All those things were character. Those things are characteristic, really, all the way across from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. But on the other hand, 
things like regeneration. I don't believe that people in the Old Testament re were regenerate. Now, I'm in a minority position on that. I'll tell you right up front. You, you can end. You can disagree with me if you want. And if you want, we'll talk about it later. But the fulfillment of that covenant was still in the future, as far as I understand, from Jeremiah 31, 31 and Ezekiel 36, 26. But there are other examples of things that the Holy Spirit did not do, like baptism by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. There was no body of Christ yet. And so he did not, was not doing that. He did not indwell people in the Old Testament. We'll look at some examples of, of uh, that might lead us to think so, but really do not teach that. Then there is uh, his work of sealing and anointing. And although miracles were present in the Old Testament, they mostly were grouped into purposeful periods. And so he did do miracles, but uh, not in the profusion that we see in the, in the book of Acts. So he only worked in part of his, his, his works, part of his ministries, but he did, and he also only worked part-time, so to speak. One excellent example of, of this is Samson. God, the Holy Spirit was forever coming upon Sam, Samson and then leaving. Coming upon Samson, but he needed him, and then leaving. And we see this throughout the judges. We see it uh, in David's life. David prayed, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now that's, there he is talking about the power of the Spirit empowering him for ministry and for his prophecy, because David was a prophet. He wrote the Psalms and uh, power to be a, a king and so on. So, but the Holy Spirit would come and go. And David is a unique exception in this case um, because the Holy Spirit's ministry to David and through David was very unique in the Old Testament times. Here's an example, though, from, from Judges, the Holy Spirit being part-time. And she said, who's she? Do I remember the context? Delilah, yes, ma'am. Yeah, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. That's the scariest verse in the entire Bible. I mean, it's just terrifying. He, didn't, he had no idea. Now, happily, we cannot be in that situation in the absolute sense. But his power had left. He didn't even know. He didn't even know. This is just an example of how the Holy Spirit would come and he would go. And he did this sovereignly, according to his will, because he is sovereign God. He also worked, you know, so the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was partial. He worked in part of his ministries, not all, but just a few comparatively. He worked part-time. He would come and go, come and go, come and go. And he would, uh, he only worked in part of the believers. You know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm basing this on the data that's available in the scriptures, Okay. And we can assume, I think safely, that there's more to the Holy Spirit's work uh, in terms of the persons he worked on and that sort of thing uh, than is recorded in what I'm about to show you. But in, in, when we contrast it with the New Testament, it's still startling. When we see, when we look at, at, at the, the Old Testament, we find, and there are different verbs used with the, with the, for the work of the Spirit, okay? But he, there are only four people who are spoken of as being filled by the Spirit. Only four out of hundreds of generations of believers. Oh, the Holy Spirit rested upon 72 people. That word occurs with the word Spirit 72 times. The Holy Spirit came upon or rushed upon people about 83 times. He clothed three people. That's 162 people. 162 people out of all the generations. Now, did the Holy Spirit do more than this? Yes, absolutely. Obviously, has to have done so. But what I'm pointing out is that this was not universal. It is, his work was not universal. It was not everybody. Not everybody got to experience this, this power of the Holy Spirit. Only certain people were singled out. Now, so the, again, to summarize, in the Old Testament, the work of the Spirit was partial. Only part of his ministries, only part of the believers, and only part-time. He would come and he would go. Are we together so far? Questions? Are you wondering what, what this is good for? 
what we're what we're working toward is we're building toward a, a great answer to understanding what it is that our charismatic friends miss. They think we're missing something. The fact is that they are missing an idea here, uh, an understanding of how the Old Testament, how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament time, and now into the Gospels, and then the great contrast, the new beginning that began on the day of Pentecost. So as we continue this overview of the Holy Spirit's work, the Gospels are the next thing. Again, partial, because really we're still under, even though it's the Gospels and they reside in the, uh, new, in the new Testament canon, the, old, the Gospels are still under the Old Testament, right? They were living under the law. Until the day of Pentecost, they were, people were living, until the, day, until the crucifixion and resurrection, people were living under the law. Until the day of Pentecost, people were basically living under the law. So this is still an Old Testament economy. Jesus taught uh, the law, among other things. Now, so the Gospels are still partial. Some believers, uh, he only worked in some believers. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus said something that was really very, very remarkable. He says, you know him, that is the spirit of truth, for he dwells with you and will, will be in you. Now, there are two very important affirmations in this uh, that we want to look at tonight, affirmations in this, in this sentence. One is that he dwells with you. This is a huge change from the Old Testament, that the, whole, the Holy Spirit is hanging with people. <laughs> that he's with them uh, in, in this very unique way. Now, it's still a small group that he's talking about, I think, because he's talking to his disciples in the upper room. And he says, you have experienced the Holy Spirit being with you, dwelling with you, abiding with you, staying with you. There's a, there's a, a duration that's implied in the use of this word that makes, it, um, that, that makes this unique from his Old Testament, come and go, come and go, come and go. So some, he worked on at least some of the believers, and he dwelled with them. That's the big expansion. That's the new thing. And then, then the, the future is mentioned here. He will be in you. This is part of the reason that I argue that no one was indwelt in the Old Testament. If people were indwelt in the Old Testament by the Holy Spirit, why would the apostles not be? Jesus says he's only with you, not in you. He will be in you, however. And again, not all his ministries are, are taking place now. So the work in the gospel is still partial. It's still partial, however, and it's still temporary. Uh, and I, what I'm about to read to you is a, is a beautiful, beautiful passage where Jesus comes to his disciples, his apostles, after their abject, complete failure. In John chapter 20, after their resurrect, after his resurrection, he comes to them. And he reaffirms their call. And in, in giving them the call after they've already failed, he gives them this temporary empowerment by the Holy Spirit. He says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, some charismatics who want to make Pentecost an ex a, a subsequent uh, experience after salvation, you want to make that the pattern, say that this is the permanent giving of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's no reason to think that, given that this is still. An Old Testament economy. And after this experience, Jesus tells them, don't you leave Jerusalem until you've received the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, who is coming. And so it's not talking about this is not the permanent giving of the Holy Spirit here. This is a temporary empowerment to enable them to even receive that commission again. Think about this. You're Peter. Or whichever other apostle you resonate with, maybe Thomas. And you saw Jesus arrested and you skidnapped. Maybe you took a slave's ear off first, but you ran, you got out while you could. And you watched the one you put all your hopes in hang on the cross and die. And you didn't do whatever you think you might could have done. Maybe you denied Jesus like Peter did very plainly. But you left. I mean, the women stayed, but you left. 
And then Jesus shows up. He comes right into the room where you're cowering in fear. Jesus is there. How do you feel? How do you feel? Oh, there's Jesus. Great. How do you feel? Okay. Embarrassed? I would be so ashamed. I would be. And if Jesus said to me, go make disciples at that moment, I would not have anything to respond with. I mean, just I'm a human being. You're a human being. I think we can under, we can put ourselves in their place a little bit, can't we? We can say, man, if I was there and he said, after I'd completely failed him, I'd run or betrayed him or made things worse by hacking off Malthus's ear. How would I feel? I would just be, I would just be overwhelmed with shame. And all the misunderstandings. I mean, if, you know, my gosh, I thought he was dead. What happened? And I thought he wasn't going to be dead. I thought we were going to have a new kingdom. I would just be overwhelmed. And if Jesus said to me, go make disciples of all nations, in that moment, I would be like, are you, who are you kidding? How can I possibly respond to that? Well, Jesus understands us perfectly, doesn't he? He really reads our hearts. He knows exactly. He knows exactly how we're feeling. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all, Psalm 139 says. He reads our hearts and he knows them exactly. He knows what we're feeling. He knows our motives. He knows our anxieties. He knows our incapacities. He knows our overwhelmness. He knows all those things. And so he gives them his Holy Spirit, this temp another temporary empowerment like we've seen through the Old Testament. So they can even receive the reinstatement into his plan. His plan has not changed. They failed. His plan has not changed. <laughs> He still wants them. Their commission is still there, but they haven't got what it takes in this moment to even hear that. And so God gives them a temporary bestowal of his Holy Spirit. I, in my understanding of the passage, so that they can receive that. Kai, please. Well, I was just going to say, doesn't that reinforce the fact that us going and making disciples or doing anything to serve the kingdom isn't in our own power? Not ever. Yeah. Kai said, uh, for those of you who are online, said that doesn't this reinforce the fact that, that Whatever command it is that God has given us to us, whether it's go make disciples or whatever, we cannot do that in our own strength. That is just absolutely so true. What did Jesus say? Without me, you can do hardly nothing, right? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm almost, I'm, I'll be 69 this year. And I, I proved that over and over. <laughs> Without me, you can do nothing. It's just so, it's just so true. And it's especially true in these, uh, in these particular, in the, for their particular, the grand, the immensity is the word I'm looking for, of the task that the apostles had laid on their backs. They couldn't do it in their own strength. There was no way. And so Jesus breathed on them. The word for breath in Greek uh, and the word for spirit are the same word, pneuma. And uh, so he breathed on them as a sign of what he was doing. And he gave them uh, the Holy Spirit so that they would even be able to receive and reprocess and rethink and understand what was happening now that he was alive again and there in front of them. But this was still a partial, this is still a partial or a temporary gift of the Holy Spirit. And John 7, 37 explains why this is not the, the, that giving of the Holy Spirit that was promised in the Old Testament that Jesus promised to his disciples. Here's what John 7, 37 to 39 says. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, let me set this up. <laughs> on, the, on this day, the great day of the feast, this is tabernacles. And the, all the Jews had been out in the countryside hacking on branches and hacking down trees to make booze, lean-tos for themselves. And they've been out working up a sweat all day. And then they come back, and there's a, a ceremony that happens during, on, the, on the last day of the feast. 
the high priest brings a, a silver pitcher of water from the pool of Siloam, which in Siloam means, you better remember, means sent, it's a picture of the Messiah. And, and, and so he brings the, uh, the silver pitcher of water from the pool of Siloam, connected to the Messiah. And he brings this water and pours it out on the altar and steam goes everywhere. And it's sort of a picture of the <laughs> water is often a picture of the Holy Spirit, and that's and, uh, as, as is wind. And it's sort of a picture of the Messiah bringing the Holy Spirit. And these guys have been the, his audience now. They've been working up a sweat. They're hot. They are thirsty. The high priest comes with, with this pig, silver pitcher full of water, psh, makes it even hotter all around. You're now we're in a sauna. Of course, they're, they're outdoors, of course, but. But then Jesus stands up. Now, just picture this. Just think, like we're having a big ceremony, like a baptism outside, maybe a church in a, at a pond. The whole church is gathered there. And some guy who's not one of the celebrants, who's not one of the clergy, who's not one of the pastors, just says, hey, everybody. Can you imagine how shocked, how that rocked everybody? And he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And drink. As the scripture said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Then John explains that to us. He says, now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Well, does that mean that there's some second experience of the Holy Spirit after salvation, second reception of that? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means the Spirit has not been given. Here's what he says. Again, John 7, 37 through 39. Whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Glorified. On the day of Pentecost, Peter says that Christ has ascended to the right hand of God and is seated at the right hand of God and has set forth this, which you both see and hear. What happened on the day of Pentecost was proof that Jesus had been glorified. And so those two are inescapably welded together by John's words and Peter's words as well. And so this is, this is simply to point out that any bestowals of the Holy Spirit, any experience with the Holy Spirit before the day of Pentecost was a temporary, still under the Old Testament economy, so to speak, because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right, so in the Gospels, we've seen so far that, that in the Old Testament, we saw that his work was partial. He worked in part of the believers, part of his ministries, part-time. The Holy Spirit did. In, in the Gospels, we see the same features. It's still partial, and it's still temporary, but something new. You can ask. Jesus said this remarkable thing. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This was mind-breaking. This is something that nobody in the Old Testament economy would have would have thought to ask. They could ask to have the, have the Holy Spirit's help and guidance and power. Let that sink in. Old Testament saints didn't even know to ask. And now Jesus is saying, if anyone asks, the Father will give him the Holy Spirit. So we've, we've come through this period of, of the partial work of the Holy Spirit. And now on the day of Pentecost, everything changes. Improves would be a better way to say it. And from the day of Pentecost, the work of the Holy Spirit is full. Now, we talked about the Old Testament. We talked about the Gospels. Any questions to this point? Yes, ma'am. I think that, that uh, David, King David, and did so much more in his ministry to his people, being a, you know, doing writing the songs mm -hmm. because he did ask. 
Yeah. Let not mm -hmm. your spirit depart from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the, that the scholars who studied pneumatology, the work of the Holy Spirit, um, point out is that David's relationship with the Holy Spirit was unique among all the Old Testament people. Uh, the Holy Spirit was given to David in a somewhat permanent way, and I'm afraid I don't have the reference here in front of me, but I will find that for you because it, it, you point out something very important. David's relationship with the Holy Spirit was very unique. And, um, and as, by the way, as we talk about uh, Old Testament work of the Holy Spirit, we, I've mentioned just kind of in passing prophecy, but I, I'm leaving out his work of, I just haven't gone into his work of, of uh, in, in inspiring the scriptures through prophets and that sort of thing. That's because that, that's not something that everybody, I'm focusing on what the rank and file believer would do. Experience, but that's a that's a great point. David David was different. Yeah. So uh, now coming to the day of Pentecost, coming to the day of Pentecost, things everything gets better, everything gets broader, wider, and uh, more more particular as well. Beginning on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit began to work in all of His ministries. There were things that. Um, that he did in the Old Testament to carry on into the New Testament, like teaching, holding back sin, conviction of sin, uh, leading and restraining. Uh, he did do some of that in, in the Old Testament. It's, it's very clear. But in things like teaching in the, in the New Testament sense, where every believer is subject to the teaching of God's Holy Spirit, that's brand new. That's new from this time. Uh, leading sanctification in the sense that we are experiencing it, regeneration, baptizing by the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. There was no body of Christ prior to the day of Pentecost. It was a new creation on that day. And so that's a new thing from them. Indwelling is something that no Old Testament saint experienced, but every single New Testament saint experiences. Sealing, anointing, uh, filling in the sense of it being an, something that every believer can access. Spiritual gifts did not exist in the Old Testament. Talents did. Spiritual abilities did. But spiritual gifts are a function of being part of the body of Christ. And so it, it wasn't those things were like not spiritual gifts in the Old Testament in the same sense that they are in the New Testament. And there's assurance and intercession. He intercedes for us, according to Romans 8. And, of course, there are still miracles. That crosses all the um, Testaments. But he's now working in all of his ministries. And now I do want to point out, and this is a lesson, for, that's a lesson for another time, that biblical data, again, shows that some aspects of the Holy Spirit's work peaked very early. And then you see an occasional jump up in miracles and healings and that sort of thing in the book of Acts. And then they began to take Rome. Even in the Bible, it's not a miracle every day. Okay? Even in the Bible, it's not that. And people who represent that, uh, people on TV and radio who suggest that you should be walking in miracles. They, they have no idea what they're talking about. I could go on, but I won't on that. <clears throat> um, he worked in all of his ministries. He also worked full time now, all the time. He was with believers uh, all of the time. Now, his empowerment can still come and go. For instance, in, in Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 17, uh, we see, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. The Holy Spirit's power can still come and go. He still is sovereign. He still fills people and he gives them power as he chooses, okay? So, and we, we see that from the fact that, that various people, named people in the New Testament are filled and then filled again later. Filling meaning being under the influence and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's take Paul as an example. Here, he's called Saul. So Ananias departed and entered the house. I'm looking at Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Ananias departed and, from his home and entered the house. And laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so 
Ananias came, he laid his hands on Paul, then called Saul, and Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then, later on, in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, we see Saul being filled again. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. We can see this trace the same kind of thing with Peter and also with groups of Peter. We can see the groups of people who are in the upper room who were all filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Also being filled with the Holy Spirit again in Acts chapter 4 as they pray after Peter and John have been released. And so filling is this ongoing thing, and it's, it is a sovereign thing that the Holy Spirit does. But again, there's, and there's more to it than that. Filling is the, is the only work of the Holy Spirit that I can think of off the top of my head that we are commanded to pursue. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, Ephesians 5.18 says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a present imperative, be filled. It means, it means it's a command, and it ought to be all the time. That's what the present tense means. Being filled means to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to be led and guided by him. It has to do with our character, our morals, our, our values, and it also is about power, too. That is. So... But it's not a one-time thing. And this is part of the charismatic era. They treat this as if it was a one-time thing because they, they mix the baptism of, by the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. They, connect, they think those are the same ministry and they're actually two separate things. So the Holy Spirit, his empowering ministries can still come and go, but we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Somebody asked... Um, her name has escaped me, a missionary in China from many years ago. What must, we, what must we do to be filled with the Spirit? And she said, stop resisting. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think there's also more to it than that. We find, if you look at, at the things that are involved with being filled with the Holy Spirit, the outflows of that, like he says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, uh, always giving thanks for all things to God and our Father, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. That's Ephesians 5, uh, 19 and following, 19 to 21. You find the same kinds of things. There's a joy in the heart. There's a, uh, a thankfulness. There is a, um, there is a submitting to one another. You find those same three things as a consequence of letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly in the book of Colossians. So there is really a connection between the word of God and the spirit of God. If we want to be filled with the spirit, if we want to stop resisting, then we kind of have to be in the word of God to know what it is he wants us to do. And as we put ourselves in the word, he, he fills us. Are we together? And it's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing experience, moment by moment. That's what we're commanded to. And so that's all about these, the empowering works. They can, they can still come and go, but he's with believers forever. Look at John 14, 6, and just let this sink in. This, this is talking about you. Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. How long will the Holy Spirit be with you? How long? How long? You got to commit to this to enjoy it. Forever. Forever. He is, <laughs> he is never going to leave you. He's never going to abandon you. No matter how bad you get, no matter how, how, how much you might trip and fall, however much you may jump off of the wagon, or whatever. He, if you believe in Jesus, he is yours forever. Forever. You are never alone. And if you are never alone, it's always too soon to give up. If you are never alone, he's always there to help you get back up and push on again and see how life changes. You're never alone. You never have to quit. You never have to give up. Ephesians 4.30 echoes this, a similar idea. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The day of redemption is when Jesus comes back. 
He's with us. We're sealed. We are just like Jesus' body was sealed in the tomb by the, by the governor's seal for protection. We are sealed in Christ. Can't get out. Nobody can undo what God has done. Now, there's much more. There's more to the sealing work of the Holy Spirit. There's other significances to that. But again, that's a lesson for another time. So he works all the time. He's with believers forever is my point in that. And he's working in all the believers. And this is just so incredible. This is so contrary to the, to the Old Testament data. He now, he works in all believers, every single believer. Acts 2 emphasizes that the Holy Spirit came to each believer present. Here's the words of Acts 2, 3. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. Every person, maybe 120 people in that upper room. I was teaching uh, in family Bible time, teaching my grandkids. They're like 11, 9, seven some something like that okay and uh, you've seen them here making noise and sitting with us sometimes uh, we were doing having a family bible time talking about the day of pentecost and we kind of arranged this thing we got three lighters and we stood the three kids up in front of a big wall mirror and then the adults stood behind them where they, and held the light where they couldn't see them and i said and so all the believers were together in, in, the, in the same room, and suddenly there appeared over every each one of their heads a, a, a something that looked like a tongue of fire. And the, the three adults standing behind them flipped their lighters all at the same time. And so the kids all had a, a flame sticking up in the back of their head as they watched themselves in the mirror. The littlest one collapsed on the ground. He was so, so excited about this. And we ought to be truly excited about this because. This is true for us. Whereas before in the Old Testament times, even during the gospels, the rank and file, the everyday people, the everyday Joes like us, didn't necessarily have any experience of the Holy Spirit. But we have him living in us. And that's the symbolism that is the, the meaning of the symbol of the flame of fire resting on each one of those believers. It wasn't just the apostles who were there. Acts 2.4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the brand new thing. And it's all his works, and it's all his, and, and it is forever. And it's for every single one of us. So, what do we do with this? Oh, here's another verse, 1 Corinthians 12.13, which is one of the most beautiful verses in, for exploding misunderstandings about about the work of the Holy Spirit and his baptism and those sort of things. First Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now let's just stop and think about that. Right? By one spirit, we were all baptized. What tense is that? We were all baptized. What tense is that? Past tense, yes, sir. How could Paul say that? Did he know? He's writing to the Corinthians. You know there's a load of unbelievers in the church. How could he say that? Of course, he wasn't talking about the unbelievers. He's talking about the believers. But how could he say that we were all baptized, past tense, if this was an experience subsequent to salvation? If, like our charismatic and Pentecostal friends teach, you can be saved but still not have the Holy Spirit or still not have this work of the Holy Spirit. He, Paul couldn't have said this. In these words, if it were not true for every body, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, which is what this verse says. We're baptized into one body at, at the moment we're saved. And so it's true for all believers. We, for by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free. So there's no cultural economic, racial distinctions. Tribalism is out the window. Today, we might put in other things that divide us, but for everyone who believes in Jesus, we're part of this is true for us. And he says, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, drinking of 
of something is, is an Old Testament metaphor. And it has to do with a full experience of something. And it's most often used in the Old Testament of, of drinking the full cup of God's wrath. So it, it has to do with a full experience of the wrath of God. But here, it's not God's wrath. It's God's spirit. We all get access to the full experience, excuse me, of God's spirit. So now our Pentecostals and charismatic friends believe that the spirit's baptism is a second experience after salvation that empowers Christians. The word of God teaches that it's something that happens at salvation. And it has to do with spiritual gifts and a number of other things that we would talk about in another, another class. So we have, let's just think for a moment about the, the significance of, of what we've been hearing. We've talked about in the Old Testament times and during the Gospels, his work, Holy Spirit's work was partial. So it improved and then there were new privileges that came during the time of the Gospels. But beginning on the day of Pentecost, the partial was done away and the full came. The partial was over. And now the Holy Spirit works in all of his ministries. He works for all time and he works in all believers, every single one of us. He lives in every single one of us. So we have an unimaginable honor. Can you just take a minute and thank God for the fact that you have the Holy Spirit living in you, that, that he came to be resident in you at the moment you put your trust in Christ? Can you just say thank you, Jesus, for that? Because that's an unimaginable honor that people in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they never knew. They never had that. But you've got it. Because you believe in Jesus. And secondly, to address directly the question that our, our uh, charismatic friend might ask is, have you been filled with the Spirit? Is your church a Spirit-filled church? They, they misunderstand what, is, what happened on the day of Pentecost. They look at Pentecost, and they look at the Gospels, and they say very clearly, obviously, the apostles were saved in the Gospels. And what do we say? Yes, absolutely, they were. But then they didn't get the Holy Spirit till later, right? And so that now is a pattern, they say, would say, for the work of the Holy Spirit in this age. And I say, no, that's where you've missed the point. Pentecost was not a subsequent to salvation kind of experience in the sense of the way they're characterizing it. Pentecost was the beginning of something brand new. This is something that never happened before. You never had anything like this in the Old Testament or in the Gospels either. And it happened only this once. And so Pentecost was an example, wasn't an example of subsequence. It was the beginning of a new way of working for God, the Holy Spirit. Now, that's where I'm going to stop. We're getting close to out of time. and I'm getting kind of dry. <laughs> My throat is getting dry. Questions, comments, all around We went really quick, didn't we? What one word characterizes the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Partial. Yes, partial. If you can remember that, you can piece the whole, all the rest of this together, at least a little bit. And we called it partial because he worked in part of his ministries, yes. And he worked in part of the believers. And he worked part-time because he would come and go, come and go. Partial. Part of his works, part of his part of the believers, part-time. Same thing is true in the Gospels, though there were some added privileges. If you can remember that much, you've got it. Then in the beginning in the New in, in the book of Acts, in Acts 2 from Pentecost, now there is full. All the believers, all of his works, and all of the time. We together? So partial, full. That's the difference. And so Pentecost is not a pattern for what has to happen to every believer. You get saved, then you receive the Holy Spirit. It's the beginning of a brand new thing that God had never done before. And it's not part of the pattern. It's actually the changing. Okay. Yes, ma'am, please. Mm -hmm. The special privileges. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, and the gospel is partial but expanding. Um, it's this last thing, but ask. That is the new thing in the gospels. Listen, you never heard this in the Old Testament. Jesus said, if you then are evil and know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so this is an open invitation, isn't it? For people to ask for the Holy Spirit. And he says, he pre-approves. Pre pre you are pre-approved. Do you ever get one of those in the mail? Of course you do. You get zillions of them. You are pre-approved. Well, he's, he's saying here that if you ask, God will, because he's good, not because we're good, uh, he will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And this is a brand new thing in the Gospels. There's no promise of, for that day of receiving the Holy Spirit, except in the book of Proverbs, one place, and many scholars say it's not a promise, and I, they might be right, but it says, turn ye in my reproof, and I will pour out my spirit on you. It sounds like a promise to me, even if it's just a, a, in the general course of Proverbs, the general way of Proverbs, even if it's just saying that if you do this, then God generally does this. That's still a great thing. And that's the closest it comes to a promise of the Holy Spirit for the people who are living under the Old Testament economy until we get to Luke chapter 11, verse 13. So it's a pretty astounding thing. So that's, thank you, Elizabeth, for giving me a chance to clarify that. Anybody else? All right. I believe we can adjourn. Trish, thank you very much for handling the Zoom stuff. Thanks, everybody. Anybody on the on the Zoom side have a question? I'm sorry, I didn't think to ask you guys. Hearing none, I'll say goodbye. Let's let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we are so grateful for the privilege of the Holy Spirit. We, we thank you that he has given, he has come to take up residence within us. He dwells within us. He is here to fill us, to teach us, to lead us, to illumine your word. He is here to, he has regenerated those of us who, who believe in, in your son. He has baptized us into your son, the body of, of Christ. He's made us part of, of his body. He's identified us with the work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. The Holy Spirit has given us spiritual gifts so that we might be able to competently do something to serve Jesus. Father, we're just so grateful for all that he has done and is doing in us. We, we choose, Father, to stop resisting and to not neglect him. Father, we, we ask that he would fill us moment by moment, and that we would be, our hearts would be soft and easy for him to direct. Lord, we want to walk in your power because it's your command to be filled with the spirit. We want to walk in your light. And so we ask that you would help us to do that. And we thank you so much in the name of Jesus. Amen.